Good morning. Welcome to worship at Gladewell United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you've tuned in to be with us this morning. This morning we are going to start out with some music. <laughs> Michelle Darmadan is going to play and sing How Great Thou Art. Please hear this. <laughs> great we are just so grateful and thankful to him that we could do this this morning and to be here this morning I would like for us to to prepare our hearts to go to the Lord in prayer think this morning of prayer prayer praises that you have you're here this morning you got up this morning you're moving this morning then think of those prayer concerns we we lift up different people in in the church and in the community, but Michelle is going to bring us into prayer. So let's just begin to, to focus in on what God is doing with us and for us. Thank you. 
Gracious Heavenly God, we give you thanks and praise and glory for the opportunity for us to, to come together and worship you this morning. Worship doesn't necessarily have to be where we're all in the same room, obviously. But worship, Lord, is when we take ourselves to you. We ask this morning that you forgive us when we are not the church or the people that we should be. Forgive us, Lord, when, when we forget whose we are and who we serve. And this morning, Lord, as we very humbly come before you, we lift up those who are afraid this morning. Who have anxieties. Lord, who do not know you as Lord and Savior of their life. For those who are grieving, Lord, we lift them to you. And during this time, Lord, we are separated from friends and family. We ask, Lord, that you just put your protective hedge around. Put your protective hedge around us. We ask, Lord, this morning you just wrap your loving arms around us and let us feel your presence with us. We lift our nation in prayer, Lord. We've come to a time when, God, I certainly hope that you have gotten our attention and that we come back to you. That we learn, Lord, to be first in our lives and all other things take a way back seat. This morning, Lord, forgive us again for our sins, those covert, those overt ones. Lord, touch our hearts. Let us take just a moment, Lord, and and just think of those people who are on our hearts this morning who need a healing touch, either physical or emotional or spiritual. Lord, we give you honor. We give you praise. In your blessed and holy name we pray. Amen. This morning, our scripture lesson, the first one comes from Matthew 26, verses 12 and 13. Please hear these words. By pouring this ointment on my body, this is Jesus speaking, she has prepared for my burial. Truly I say to you, whenever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Now let's go to math to John, Gospel of John, verses chapter 12, if you want to look at it with me. John 12, verses 1 through 8. This is the story. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the house of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And there they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those who were at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he was he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used it to steal what was put into it. And Jesus said, leave her alone. 
She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always had the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say thanks be to God. You know, I grew up on a farm in, in Giles County. Summertime found us kids putting up hay with the adults, and then we'd go off to the creek to cool down. So whenever I hear and smell the newly mowed grass or hay that drifts in the air, I suddenly recall my childhood memories of summers on being home on the farm. And whenever I get a whiff of Estee Lauder's beautiful perfume, I think of my mother, because that was her signature perfume. And whenever I smell pizza, I think of my grandson, Kyle, who loves cheese pizza. You see, we're told by scientists that while words go to the thinking part of our brain, smells, those fragrances, go to the emotional part of our brain. And that's why a whiff of grandma's perfume brings grandma herself back to your memory, even if it's just for a moment. And for some people, a whiff of incense brings to mind to them the divine. The anointing oil that I use is a combination of frankincense and myrrh, and it smells, it smells divine. This passage from John's Gospel that I just read to you is a fragrance text. Jesus' friend Mary, and she's only named in John's Gospel. If you go back and read the other accounts, she's not named. Takes a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and anoints or bathes the feet of Jesus and then wipes his feet with her hair. And the house is filled with the fragrance of the oil. Somewhere I read that this oil in today's currency was probably worth about $10,000. And to us, it may strike us as strangely sensual that Mary wipes the perfume off his feet with her long flowing hair. And it is an amazing scene. And in Matthew's gospel, and I read it to you, he adds a very memorable remark when he says, when Jesus says, and Matthew quotes this, assuredly I say to you, whenever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. You see, that's incredible. Jesus actually said that whenever this gospel story is told, wherever it's told, this thing that Mary did will be remembered. It'll be talked about. And here we are, 2,000 years later, in a place halfway around the world, that what Mary did long ago is, is still being told. It's a lasting tribute to a woman's love for Jesus Christ. I think that Mary wanted to demonstrate that she loved him and that she somehow understood that as he set his face toward Jerusalem and the cross, that she understood the pain that he was about to bear. Perhaps she wanted to identify with him the way that he had identified with her during all of her struggles. Somebody once said, and I remember this because it struck home with me, love expressed is not sufficient. It needs to be heard and have meaning. In other words, it's not adequate for you to say to somebody that you love them, and that's a good start though, but you must get into the mind of the person that, that you love and find out what's most meaningful to that person and then give love in the way that they understand and it means something to them. So if love expressed is not sufficient and needs to have any meaning, Colleen Mary expressed her love in a profound, lovely way. And Jesus obviously heard it. Because again, as I quote from Matthew, assuredly I say to you, Jesus said, whenever this gospel is preached in the whole world, that this, what this woman has done will always be told 
as a memorial to her. Somewhere I read that when the chips were down in Jerusalem and the storm clouds were gathered around Jesus, that there was nobody to speak for him. You see, the crowd that, that turned into a mob was fickle. On Sunday, they were shouting, Hosanna's blessed be the name of, of, of Jesus, the son of David. And then five days later, they were crying, crucify him. It's easy to point fingers, but before we start doing that, however, let's bear in mind that here we are in America, and there are thousands and thousands of people who, if you ask, identify themselves as Christians, but would not speak up for him. My hope, my prayer, is that God has gotten our attention, and we will not let those opportunities pass anymore, slip away for any reason. Because we have allowed the gospel to often be twisted to support our own opinions, our own lifestyles, and even our own politics. And this has got to stop. Jesus' message was of love and hope and healing. And that's the message that we need to speak up for. Back to Mary. I wonder if she knew that he was about to die. I wonder if she sensed the events were posed for some horrendous, catastrophic end. Because it was just days before that would happen. It seems to me that Mary may have been the only one right then who did understand. And I wonder if Mary didn't break her box of perfume to show Jesus, well, I, I got it. I understand. If she had wanted to anoint Jesus as a king, she would have anointed his head. You only anointed the feet of, of dead people. And I think that Mary understood. I think Mary got it. Think about this for a minute. And I did this week. Where do we find Mary most of the time? We find Mary at the feet of Jesus. And there's something very special about people who spend a lot of time at Jesus' feet. I think they have what somebody calls a sixth sense. When we practice the discipline of spending time with God in prayer and scripture every day, we develop a, a maturity that leads to, to spiritual discernment. And the only people who have that spiritual discernment and understanding and insight are people who sit at the feet of Jesus. And Mary did that. And that's why I believe Mary understood. She got it. We live in an instant society. And I know that we're used to having everything instantly all the time. And the last few weeks have made us slow down even if it happened for all the wrong reasons. But it has given us the opportunity to understand there is no substitute for taking the time day by day for us to sit at the feet of Jesus. Now, on the other side of this story is Judas, the man who probably echoed the thoughts of everybody who was in that room. Judas felt that Mary did a lot of wasting there when she cracked open that, but that Spike Nard could have been saved and sold. He was upset. He said that he thought the money should have been given to missions to the poor, and instead she wasted it. I love this, though. Jesus comes to Mary's defense in verse 7. Go back and look at it. And he tells Judas, leave her alone. It was intended that she save this perfume for the day of my burial. I want to paraphrase that. Jesus said to Judas to stop annoying this woman. Leave her alone. Out of all you in this room, she's the one who understands. She's the only one who really gets it. I have heard it said that Judas kept the bag and Mary broke the box. She gave all that was precious to her to him. And that's why Jesus said, whenever the gospel is preached throughout the entire world, what Mary did will be remembered. 
Now, I understand that your most valued possession is not probably a $10,000 bottle of perfume that you keep in your bedroom. But there is something in your life that is very precious, that is very valuable. What is it? Well, think about it. You have to name it. You got to search your heart and, and name it. What is the most precious thing in your life or most valuable? And I'm not talking about the person or, or persons. I'm talking about other things like your desire to succeed, maybe, or your self image, or your job, or a bank account, your house, your car. It's up to you to figure that out. But the most important question is this, after you have figured out what your most valuable possession is, would you or could you give it up for Jesus? Would you be willing to go somewhere that God's called you to go? Would you be willing to give it all up and do something that God has called you to do? Would you be willing to sacrifice money or possessions or time or talents for building the kingdom of God right here on earth, right here, right now? What would you be willing to sacrifice for your church and your community? Would you be willing to give and consider giving more than, you know, or at least giving the designated 10% of your salary to God? Now, let me tell you, God doesn't need it. God does not need your most valuable possession, but you need it to make it serve the greater purpose. You need to give that to serve the greater purpose. This is the season of Lent, and a time where we have the opportunity to reevaluate our hearts and our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. We know how extravagant God's love is for us. Look at John 3, 16 and 17. It tells us that. The question is, how extravagant is your love for God? Is it extravagant at all? Or do you just simply go through the, the, the motions every day? You know, when we could come to church, you know, you come to church when it's convenient. And you sing the hymns in church, well, most of the time anyway. And you utter prayers when it's time to pray inside and outside the church, sometimes. And you listen to the preacher when you think she's interesting. And when she's not interesting, you make your grocery list or just check out somewhere else or don't come back. But the question is for us this morning, is do you love others the way that Jesus loved? And do you love others as much as you love yourself? Do you make a place in your life and do you make a place in our church for the outcast, the rejected, the oppressed, the homeless, the addicted, the hungry, the least, the last, the lost, the lonely, the victimized and marginalized souls who Jesus loved? Remember, love expressed is not sufficient. It's not good enough to say, well, I love them. And I love God. You know, I come to church. I sing the hymns. And as good as those things are, and as much as we are missing that opportunity to be in church right now, love is expressed, but it's not sufficient. It has to be heard and it has to be demonstrated to have any meaning. You see, the song says that they will know we are Christians by our love. Mary's love was extravagant. She gave her most valuable possession. And whenever the gospel is preached around the entire world, Mary will always be remembered. You know, I love those last three, in that last verse three, these last words in verse 3, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Of course, when she when she cracked that box open, that fragrance filled the whole, the whole house. It was everywhere. 
And when she wiped that ointment off his feet with her hair, wherever Mary went after that, the fragrance was sure to go. And the blessing given to Jesus ended up shared with other people. The fragrance of that oil would remind people of her love for Jesus. Wherever she walked, wherever people saw Mary, they caught that whiff of that fragrance and, and they would think about Jesus, I think. Wherever the gospel is preached, Mary will be remembered even today. And as I end this message, there was one thought that kept running through my mind. You know, all this happened just a few days before Jesus' final days in Jerusalem. And such a strong perfume would have lasted a long time. So I'm thinking everywhere Jesus went, as he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, as he cleansed the temple, as he gathered with his disciples in the upper room, as he appeared before the high priest and before Pilate, I wonder if the fragrance of Mary's perfume still lingered faintly as a reminder of her great love for him. And then perhaps, well, just perhaps, when Jesus uttered from the cross his words of forgiveness and when it was completed on the cross, I wonder if he might have sensed the faint, sweet fragrance that reminded him that he had been greatly loved. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love and your grace in your mercy for us. Amen. Prepare your hearts for the benediction as, as Michelle brings us some music. I will rise. circumstances are this week. Remember that God is in control. God knows what you need. He hears our fears. He is our hope. He is our protector. And he will ultimately deliver us from this scary time. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.